Good morning, Bucknutters. Welcome to the Bucknuts Morning 5 here on Friday, December 11th, 2020. I am Dave Biddle. I am very happy to be joined by Jonah Booker for his usual Friday visit. Jay Book, let's start right at the top. Emeka Ekbuka, the number one wide receiver in the country in the 2021 class, is expected to commit to Ohio State later today. He will announce his decision. Just your thoughts on that development. Yeah, it's finally going to come to an end here. I know you and I have been, you know, speculating and talking about his recruitment for months. And feels like it, years, doesn't it? <laughs> it feels like years. And I tell you what, Dave, the most beautiful thing about that is Ohio State has pretty much led wire to wire when it comes to this recruitment. And that tells you the job that Brian Hartline and the staff was able to do when it comes to his total overall recruitment. What Ohio State is getting is another primetime player, five-star player, number one wide receiver in the country, a guy that they think can play on the inside or the outside. He's uh, tremendously gifted. His body frame is already college ready. Uh, at one of the, the local – at the, the national combines, he was able to pop a 4 4 40 laser time. So once he did that, that's when you really saw his – uh, rankings and ratings skyrocket because you combine that with his ball skills, his body size, the top end speed. What you're getting is the best pound for pound pure wide receiver in this 2021 class. And for those that don't know, signing day is Wednesday, early signing period. It's really just signing day now because all except for like a guy here and there, the top prospects are all going to be signing on Wednesday if. The last couple of years hold true to form. It's really creeped up on me. I'm sure it's creeped up on a lot of people, but this Wednesday will be signing day. When you, well, now we won't know this Wednesday, but do you think when the dust settles, Jonah, do you think the Buckeyes have a chance of catching Alabama and beating them for the number one class? It's not like there's that big of a gap right now. Alabama has 22 commits, Ohio State has 20. The average player ranking is almost identical. So the Crimson Tide, by having two extra players, are ahead of the Buckeyes right now. But, uh, especially if the Buckeyes get a Mecca later today, do you think they can catch the Crimson Tide? I do think they can catch him. I think it's going to come down to the very end. I don't think it would be officially settled until the second signing day in February. Cause if you, if you um, throw a Mecca in this class, Ohio state is, is inching even closer. Um, and then with, with a Mecca in the fold, now you're building that Washington pipeline with a Mecca and, G. Scott Jr. there. Now, what are, what the, what's the eyes on the prize? Is J.T. Tilamalu, the five-star defensive tackle, top 10 player in 24-7, who a lot of people also believe that Ohio State is the front runner. They've been holding that position for quite a bit of time. So if they can land uh, him, I do think it's going to come down to, you know, uh, a prospect here or there that signs in February once all the dust settles and we see who all signs in December, that's when you're going to be able to see who's left out there and what the needs are that Ohio State feels that they want to get a, a, a one or two more prospects in the fold with an outstanding class. And either way it goes, uh, even if Ohio State doesn't catch Alabama, it is an elite class. It's a class that not many teams in the country has the recruiting chops to get. Ohio State is bringing in – position of needs all all across the field there especially at the defensive back position but you also have two bell cow running backs coming in and the thing that you really have to like about this incoming class is you're going to have a significant amount of those young freshmen on campus come january so you'll see some of those guys um participating in and potential playoff bowl practice if they're if they're uh, early enrollees because with the new NCAA rules once guys are on campus they can start practicing they can't play in the games but they can get out there and, and get some scout team reps and start to get their feet wet you saw it last year at Alabama in their playoff run they had uh, or uh, two years ago with Alabama in their playoff run and they had quite a bit of their incoming freshmen out there playing let's switch gears from recruiting and look at the Buckeyes 2020 team they're only playing for a national championship at this point no big deal they are in the big 10 championship game thankfully the big 10 waived the six game minimum let me ask you this if ohio state beats northwestern do you think that they are definitely in the college football playoff being six and zero 
with a Big Ten championship? Do you think it would need to be Florida losing uh, to Alabama? Just what are your thoughts on that scenario? Yeah, if right now what the committee is telling everyone is Ohio State, they are clearly one of the top four teams in their eyes. I don't think Texas a and necessarily has a shot here. They're on the outside looking in. That uh, that blowout loss to Alabama is going to hang around their neck. And with Ohio State, even though they may not have the resume compared to everyone else, the committee this year, they're taking to – they're taking into account the eye test and that win against Michigan state and blowout win, I think signifies uh, to everyone else that Ohio state barring a a massive collapse from Alabama and Notre Dame come play, come uh, conference championship weekend, Ohio state is in. And I know in the boarding house and on bug nets, we had, um, there was several scenarios that were ironed out and I'll just go over those if Alabama and Notre Dame wins, you're looking most likely at Ohio State as a three seed playing against Notre Dame and Pasadena. If Alabama loses and and uh, Florida wins, you're looking at Notre Dame as a one or Clemson as a one. Ohio State could move up to the number two playing against Florida in the three C where that game would be played at. It would most likely be um, down South. If, if Notre Dame wants to play out West, if Clemson wants to play down South, then it's going to be Ohio State, Florida out West. The, as you mentioned, the, the stick in the road is if you have a, a scenario where Alabama gets blown out and Notre Dame gets blown out by Clemson. Now you're looking at, at, a little bit of trouble Ohio State's way because the committee could say Alabama led, you know, they were our number one team the entire season and their one hiccup is here. Do we still consider them a top four team because they have more data points to look at? I don't know. That's That would be a lot of controversy there and the same question for Notre Dame because Notre Dame's been number two with them the entire time and they beat Clemson. Do, would a committee want to see a three, uh, you know, a third time with Clemson and Notre Dame? And then the other scenario is, is just if, uh, you know, Clemson wins, Alabama wins, then you're looking at another rematch here with Clemson and Ohio State. So there's a variety of scenarios here. But for the most part, if Ohio State just handles their business, goes out to the Big Ten Championship and looks impressive against Northwestern, there's no doubt in my mind that they will be in the college football playoffs barring there's not some epic collapse in the in the conference championships which I highly doubt. So I've watched Northwestern a decent amount this year and I was impressed with them, you know, when they have a good defense, a lot of these guys that are going to be playing against Ohio State in the Big 10 championship game like Patty Fisher and a lot of these guys on defense were sophomores the last time Ohio State played them in the Big Ten Championship game. And Peyton Ramsey's kind of like a sneaky, good college quarterback. Like He's not going to be an NFL quarterback, but he's a winner. He was actually pretty good at Indiana. Now he's transferred to Northwestern as a fifth-year senior, and he's good. So I'm thinking, man, Northwestern's actually like a really good team this year. Then, Jay Book, they somehow lose to terrible Michigan State. <laughs> and, you know, I, I don't know what to make of this team. I feel like Ohio State's not going to have too much trouble with them, but just what do you make of Northwestern this year? Yeah, to me, I think they're they're a little bit up up and down, especially when it comes to their offense. Uh, you know, you go out against Michigan State, and you absolutely laid an egg there, as you mentioned. That Michigan State team, they are they, that's not a very good football team, and they manhandle Northwestern up front. And as you mentioned, the solid defense, but when I look at their defense, they're going against pretty much the Big Ten West, and right now in the Big Ten is not a very good conference top to bottom. I mean, some of these programs look like they do not want to even play right now. But, you know, looking at looking ahead at the Big Ten Championship, I know Vegas has this as a 20-point game. In my mind, I don't think Northwestern matches up athletically with Ohio State. Yeah, they have a, a solid defense there, but you get Ohio State on a fast track. Ohio State's getting all of their guys back. They're going to be hungry to make a statement to make sure that they uh, lock in a playoff spot. 
I, I think it's a bad matchup for Northwestern. I don't think they have the horses to run with Ohio State here. Uh, come game day, you may I may be sprinkling a little money on the Buckeyes here because I think the Buckeyes will come out hungry and they will come out with a point to prove. And I just don't think Northwestern has the athleticism to match up with Chris Alave and Garrett Wilson. As long as the offensive line can hold up and uh, on the pass protection, Justin Fields should have all day to throw. And I really like the way the running game is starting to uh, be established with Trey Sermon getting uh, about seven, seven point eight yards a touch the last three games. And Master T has been solid. I know a lot of people complain about his home run hitting the belly ability, but he's been solid. The running game is one of my least concerns here. So as long as the offensive line can pass pro, Ohio State will put up 40 some points on them. Now, you mentioned there are some teams out there in college football that don't really want to play right now. So with that in mind, let's finish the show talking about Michigan. Um, What are your thoughts on the program up there? They're now offering Harbaugh a contract extension, but with a lower salary. And listen, I know they have COVID issues, you know, all joking aside. I I really believe if they could play the game, they would. Um, But there's also, I mean, a lot of Michigan fans are talking about how the team quit on Harbaugh. What do you make? That's a lot to unpack there. Harbaugh's future, what's going on right now at Michigan? Just what do you make of all of that, Jonah? It's a mess, Dave. It's an absolute dump, dumpster fire in year six of Jim Harbaugh's tenure there. Would Did they quit? I mean, if you watched them play, you would see the lack of effort, the lack of firepower the, uh, as, far, as far as the team executing. It just wasn't there. And when I watched that – that game wire to wire against Wisconsin, and they just absolutely destroyed them up front. They want they wanted nothing more from Wisconsin once the fourth quarter came around. At that point, Wisconsin went old school uh, eye formation with the fullback and just smashed it down their throat. I thought it was hilarious. But as far as their their players, you know, you hope that the guys that got COVID have a, a healthy recovery. But at the same time, if you believe what the local media have been saying in Detroit, you go into their message boards. Michigan absolutely did not want to play that Ohio State game. And a lot of people believe that their quarterbacks would have been out, both of them, because of contract tracing. So that's one of the reasons that. They weren't going to play that game, and that's why a lot of people were hinting several weeks ago that Michigan wasn't going to play. It's because they wouldn't have had a, a, a starting caliber quarterback going into Columbus. And, and to me, I just think that when Wisconsin did that early on, it opened the door for other teams to do it. Like, hey, our quarterback room is thin. Uh, maybe we shouldn't play because we might not be competitive. Uh, but as far as Jim's contract, it's a mess because it's signing days next week. Recruits don't know if Jim's going to be there or not. Um, supposedly, if you if you to believe John Bacon, which you know someone he's someone who's dialed into the the program as much as anyone. There's several NFL teams out there that that's interested in Jim, which I don't understand that at all. Uh, so it, so they neither and the, and the, on top of that, the AD said they're not even going to you know, really dive into his contract until the end of the season. Well, when, when's the end of the season? After the bowl games or after the crossover games? So you're just going to leave recruits in limbo signing next week that they don't know if the guy that they're signing up for is going to be actually there. So to me, it, it, it's a mess. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if Jim ended up walking. But as far as Ohio State fans, I'm, I'm all here for him signing up for another three years and we can continue to see the Michigan meltdown continue. Yeah, it's just too bad. The Buckeyes can't smoke them tomorrow at the Horseshoe as schedule. That's just, it's such a bummer. It's never a bummer having Jonah Booker on the Bucknuts Morning 5. Thank you very much, Jay Book. And thank you to all the listeners out there for tuning into the program. Have a great weekend, Bucknutters. Bucknutters.